Dear colleagues, welcome to today's ERO webinar on performance of oral anticoagulants in high-risk patient populations with atrial fibrillation. My name is Jan Steffel from the University Hospital of Zurich, and I have the great pleasure of being joined by Professor Ronan Collins from Tala University Hospital in Dublin tonight. Good evening. Thank you, Jan. Hello. Um, also, Professor Honos from Frankfurt was supposed to be here, but unfortunately he fell ill this morning and couldn't make it. Uh, we anyways wish him all the best. The aim of this webinar is to give you a better understanding of a couple of topics. One, is anticoagulation management for atrial fibrillation different than the frail and the very elderly? When and how to restart anticoagulation therapy after moderate to severe bleeding? And also, does the has bled still have a role in anticoagulation management? Now, we'll go through this uh, with the help of some clinical case presentations. And this session, and that is important, is interactive. So we strongly encourage you to actively participate by sending your questions and comments at any time during the webinar through the chat. I can't promise that we'll be able to go through all of them, but we'll do our very best. For the best learning experience, we also invite you to participate in the online assessment sessions in the form of MCQs that will be submitted during the presentations. Now, this program tonight is supported by Beringer Ingelheim in the form of an educational grant. To start us out, uh, let me give you a brief introduction to the topic. Now, as you know, 2019 marks the 10th anniversary of the advent of the NOACs. Uh, it was actually just 10 years ago at the ESC in 2009 uh, when the first NOAC trial, the first phase 3 randomized clinical trial comparing a NOAC to vitamin K antagonist uh, came out, the RELY trial. And uh, I don't know about you, Ronan, but you know, I did not really anticipate the results of that. No, yeah. Nor the results of the three other trials that were to follow. You know, we felt that, you know, they might be a little, you know, they might be as good as warfarin, they might be a little bit better in terms of, you know, the way to handle them, you don't need INR monitoring, but ultimately they turned out to be at least as good, if not better than warfarin. And at the same time, there was really no signal for an increased risk of bleeding. On the contrary, uh, the most feared type of bleeding, intracranial hemorrhage, was consistently reduced with all four NOACs. And um, this has really led to a paradigm shift in the way that we use anticoagulants in atrial fibrillation. And these data, these randomized clinical trial data, then were supplemented with the uh, with registry data, which really overall, if you just want to put it into one sentence, uh, really confirmed the results from the randomized clinical trials. And ultimately, taking this even one step further, um, actually showed some very important um, uh, results on, on, a, on a more general level. And I'll go through those um, in my slides. These are my disclosures. Because the, the Swedish have these terrific uh, um, uh, registries where they just simply have every single patient included. And this is one of those registry uh, data that I'm uh, about to show here that just came out uh, from the Stockholm uh, region. Well, in Sweden, as you can see, um, as of 2011, basically when the, uh, when the NOACs hit the, hit the market, hit the clinical arena, there was a nice uptake of NOACs um, all throughout. At the same time, uh, vitamin K antagonists really were on on their, on, the way, on their way uh, down or even out. And um, this is not a big surprise. This is what we've seen all throughout. However, what was a surprise, though, or at least something very worthwhile noticing, was that, in fact, this came along with a, a reduced rate of ischemic stroke. If you compare a cohort of patients treated in 2012 in the blue circles with 2017 in the red circles, you can see that in fact the incidence of ischemic stroke was lower in 2017 compared to 2012, and that was true for all types of ages, for, through all groups of ages, so including, like we're, what we're talking about tonight, uh, the, the, the elderly, the frail, and in fact, also all throughout all uh, categories of the CHADS-VASC or, or um, uh, strata of the CHADS-VASC score, even in the high CHADS-VASC patients. You can also appreciate that the absolute uh, difference is the largest in the highest risk patients, so in the oldest and also in the ones with the highest CHADS-VASC. Uh, 
Now, of course, you're asking yourself, so what's the price we pay? How much more bleeding do we see? Well, in fact, interestingly enough, the rate of severe bleedings were pretty much exactly the same in the two years, 2012-2017. So, of course, these are registry data. There's always limitations to them, like residual confounding. There's also coding issues, of course. But I think these data really go into a very interesting direction as to, you know, what we've been doing over these years seems to be paying off. And in fact, um, you might be thinking they're only starting to, you know, anticoagulate the easy patients, the, the low-risk patients, but in fact that's not the case. If you compare the 2012 and the 2017 cohort, you'll see that there's an uptake of NOACs virtually all throughout all categories of ages, but also and particularly in the elderly. You can also see that this is mainly driven, obviously, by the uptake of NOACs, and, but really it is, it is all throughout all types of uh, age groups, and it's also in high-risk patients. It's in patients with high CHATS-VAS scores, but it's also in patients with high HASBLET scores. So this is really something very interesting to keep in mind. The HASBLET score, as you know, one of our questions, one of our goals, right, mm -hmm. was introduced in 2010 and has been misinterpreted in many ways because it was never meant to be a score by which just in and of itself we should not anticoagulate yeah. somebody, right? It was really more meant to remind us of the modifiable bleeding risk factors because HASBLET and CHADS-VASC track along so well and patients with a high HASBLET score usually also have a high CHADS-VASC score. So this is really what this is, uh, this is good for. And in fact, these data are really quite interesting because they, like I said, indicate that what we're doing, that we're actually moving away, moving out of our comfort zone and moving also into anticoagulating these difficult to treat patients seems to be paying off in terms of reducing the incidence of ischemic stroke. Um, of course, with all of the huge body of evidence that we have, there still are some questions that remain unanswered. This is why we actually, Hein Heidbüchel and the group in 2013 brought brought out for the first time the European Heart Rhythm Association Practical Guide on the Use of NOACs. And um, yeah, last year we may, uh, published a completely novel and, and reworked version of this. Uh, Ronan was one of the uh, key pillars of this uh, excellent group of people that we had the pleasure to, uh, to work with on this. And uh, we hope that you find this useful in case you haven't downloaded it yet. This is the address where you can download this um, for free. So, basically, uh, Ronan, with that, I would like to uh, hand over to you, um, and you have a very nice and very instructive case uh, that you're uh, showing us tonight about anticoagulation, AFib, and a really difficult dilemma. Well, thank you, Jan. And just to pick up on the theme of what you were saying, I'm struck very much by that evidence uh, from the Swedish registry. And, of course, if this is replicated across Europe, we're going to see a major reduction in stroke numbers, yeah. which is which is important, really. I think when we bear in mind from the stroke side of the equation, the Stroke Alliance for Europe has predicted a major increase in most Western European countries in the absolute numbers of stroke. But, of course, if we do get effective anticoagulation, and I'm always struck by the Euroheart work done in the early noughties, yeah. that's showing that you know the high-risk group of people, we were anticoagulating at best 50% of mm. people in that high-risk group, and that was because that warfarin really wasn't designed for an older population that probably needed the drugs most. I'm also struck very much as a geriatrician by the theme, of course, that most advances in uh, medicine benefit older people as mm -hmm. much, if not more, because mm -hmm. they have more to lose, as we're going to touch on later on in terms of frailty. And so I think these are important concepts to bear in mind as well. I, coming back to the case that I was, I chose, this is, I, I work as a stroke physician and I'm a geriatrician by background as well, and I work very much closely with my colleagues in cardiology in Tal University Hospital in dealing with atrial fibrillation. But this is one of the more difficult cases we've had recently. I think it raises several of the dilemmas that people may find useful that we address here tonight. These are my disclosures. And then just moving to long, let me give you a slightly younger uh, person than I normally have. It's a 63-year-old man. And he presented with a relatively mild stroke, a mild right hemiparesis, only scoring three in the National Institute of Health Stroke Scale for Drift, background history of hypertension and diabetes. Rather interestingly, and we didn't have much of a history at the time, but he told us he had an interest cerebral hemorrhage five years ago from which he made a good recovery and he had no intercurrent illness. So technically, this is a man, if he had atrial fibrillation, would be a CHADS 2 vascular 4, of course, but 
if we, when he first came into the hospital, he has a kind of left hemipresis, but the only abnormality we could see was on the left side of his CT scan, there's in his areas of hyperdensity, which probably related to the prior hemorrhage or an intercurrent ischemic event, but wouldn't have accounted for his current presentation, Jan. And of course, then when we did uh, the MRI, lo and behold, we find two lesions uh, in terms of one in the external capsule on the right side and also one in the right cerebellar hemisphere as well. Mm. And so he's got two small little infarcts here, acute infarcts and diffusion weighted imaging and then we retrieved these old scans and you can see this rather large left-sided intracerebral hemorrhage which is not quite basal ganglia and not quite lower it is, would be what's considered subcortical cortical mm. uh, border intracerebral hemorrhage mm. uh, it might be consistent with a cerebral amyloid angiopathy but certainly a substantial mm. looking hemorrhage as you can see yeah. but so we follow up in terms of our MRI and lo and behold we see a load of micro hemorrhages and there's about eight micro hemorrhages on that slide and most of them actually are subcortical rather than in the lower hemispheres as such and maybe more consistent with a hypertensive etiology mm -hmm. rather than amyloid angiopathy but again it's a consideration of what you what you think you're going to do down the line yeah. and so this man with a relatively mild stroke gets admitted to our stroke unit we think that the infarction is the major immediate concern, so he's put on high dose aspirin, he gets an MDT assessment, which is very important in stroke care, and he gets a proper workup. We can see that his carotid Doppler shows no significant stenosis. He gets 96 hours of cardiac monitoring, he's free, free from atrial fibrillation. We did notice, however, that he's got frequent APCs. We do a transesophageal echocardiogram, and it's normal, and it's normal in the sense of completely normal, mm. normal left atrium. Uh, no visualized thrombus in the left atrial appendage, no PFO and bubble study, and a normal aortic arch. So no obvious embolic source. He makes a very good recovery, so he's discharged happily uh, at day eight home with a follow-up blood pressure monitor because we know he has hypertension. Mm -hmm. And we decided that we might do an LP to see the, is his um, beta amyloid level normal, given that he's got several of these microam um, hemorrhages. Now, AP APCs is atrial premature beats, huh? Premature, so he has absolutely. frequent atrial extracystoles, uh, but no atrial fibrillation. No atrial fibrillation. Okay. Just very frequent APCs, as you okay. say. So, And so the first question to the audience, basically, in terms of stroke prevention, I know this is slightly a stroke question. So is aspirin monotherapy correct? Would we go with dual antiplatelet therapy? Should we assume that he's got two small infarcts, that this is a cardioembolic etiology and start an oral anticoagulant? Should we assume that this is an embolic stroke of undetermined source and start them on an OAC with the bigotron. We've had some recent uh, um, trial evidence on that. Or should we assume that's an embolic stroke of undetermined source and start OAC with rivaroxaban as we've some trial evidence on that. Okay, that's uh, that's some interesting questions and you know sometimes you feel that something is obvious, sometimes you feel that some of the trial evidence is obvious which indeed then doesn't turn out to be so obvious after all. And when I look at our responses, um, Ronan, uh, there's actually over 50% that would go with number one, that right. feel that aspirin monotherapy would be the correct answer here. Well, now I feel, I feel happier okay, given that that's what we did ourselves. And so we went with aspirin monotherapy. You could also make an argument maybe for dual antiplatelets in this situation. And mm -hmm. this is recent evidence from the POINT trial. I know we're slightly strained into stroke medicine, but it's of interest. Uh, and it showed that dual antiplatelet therapy in TIA or minor stroke was associated with 1.5% absolute reduction in ischemic events. But importantly also, making the point that if you use dual antiplatelets, you get a 0.5% absolute increase in major bleeding as well. And, you know, antiplatelets are not innocent uh, either. So I think aspirin monotherapy might have been the right choice here myself, uh, mm -hmm. again, given that we made it, of course. Mm -hmm. Now, you could also argue, of course, it's got four legs and a tail and it barks. Surely it's, it's a dog, dog right? It's a dog. It has it's to a, be dog. a dog. And we always thought in terms of stroke medicine, that's an embolic stroke of undetermined source. It's got an embolic pattern. That's a little shower that's gone up, two different vascular territories. It must be a dog. Well, a woodchuck has got four <laughs> legs and a tail and it barks as well, apparently. And, of course, we have Bob Hart's evidence here now in terms of Navigate Esus with Rivaroxaban, which basically showed that we didn't get a reduction uh, in ischemic uh, stroke when we treated what seemed to be embolic pattern stroke with, with a, an oral anticoagulant versus aspirin. And we'd got a corresponding increase in mm. bleeding. Yeah. And this was very disappointing for us in the stroke world. And, of course, this has been mirrored by those of you who were lucky enough to be in Canada to hear Christophe 
Afdina present the first results of respect to ESOS, which looked similarly at the bigotrin, and again showed that there was no reduction, significant reduction in ischemic stroke events. And interestingly, in that trial, the rate of hemorrhage was greater in the antiplatelet than with the bigotrin. Which brings me back to my point, which is relevant later, that antiplatelets aren't always innocent either, yet we have less of a reticence with antiplatelets than we have with oral anticoagulants. Absolutely. And so we march on. Question to the audience as well, and I'm very interested in my cardiology colleagues uh, as to what I should have done. I should have actually maybe liaised a bit closer. Should we have said to this patient after 96 hours in a completely normal TOE, realistically, you don't have PAF, I can reassure you about that. Should we have said that you should have further prolonged ambulatory monitoring on discharge? Does this patient fulfil the criteria for an implantable cardiac monitor? Is that the route we should go down? Was the observation of frequent atrial premature contractions on initial monitoring prognostic? Is that of any steer as to what we should do? And are biomarkers of any use in this situation? And it would be interesting to hear what the audience think about this. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it, it, already, it already enters into the field that we'll be, we'll be touching on in a minute, right? I mean, we have all these beautiful hypotheses and, you know, we have all these beautiful ideas of how things develop. But ultimately, there's nothing wrong, and there's nothing worse than a, a beautiful hypothesis that is then ultimately proven wrong absolutely. by ugly facts, right? Yeah. And uh, this, is, this goes into that direction. I mean, you know, some of the things just, you know, we need to have the evidence. We need to have trial evidence to ultimately answer this. Now, uh, from from the, the poll here, there's a pretty close call between number two and number three. Um, some of the audience would have gone with a, a prolonged ambulatory monitoring as actually the majority. And 31% uh, would have gone with the loop recorder. You know, this is very interesting, and of course, going back to if you we we've known for quite some time that the longer you monitor, the more you find atrial fibrillation. I think the current guidelines, both in the ESC, would recommend that you should at least have seven days of monitoring after ischemic stroke. The Americans would go with thirty. If you look at Wallman's study done in the mid noughties a very important piece of evidence that says two things: if you monitor after an ischemic event, you will pick up more atrial fibrillation up to six months. And if you pick out people who have frequent atrial premature contractions, you get a much higher uh, pickup rate. So maybe if you've got limited resources and you're trying yeah. to decide who do I prolong monitor, who do I not prolong monitor, you know, beyond uh, the initial seven days, then maybe people who've got frequent APCs we might monitor for longer mm. or consider for a device, yeah. which leads you on to the slide on the right, which, of course, is the Crystal AF slide. Yeah, the Crystal AF study, right? I mean, that is really, that was a very nice trial, right? I mean, comparing uh, implantable cardiac uh, monitors um, with standard of care. And, you know, this study was really interesting in the sense that it showed us, obviously, the increased uh, incidence of atrial fibrillation, which goes up to one-third of patients after three years, really. Um, but on the other hand, we have to be honest. I mean, this was really a trial to diagnose atrial fibrillation. It was not a trial to ultimately prove that we need to anticoagulate these patients. Absolutely. And this is really something that we're still not 100% certain about. Which ones, even in the secondary prevention setting, should we then anticoagulate? It's a difficult question. No, it's very true. And of course, there's, a big, there's, a, there's always that big uh, challenge to us. Yeah. The screening actually yeah. reduced the incidence of stroke. And of yeah. course, is atrial fibrillation a broader marker of underlying vascular disease? Was it really the etiologically the cause of the stroke in yeah. the first place? But the important thing, I think, from Chris the AF, and I suppose relevant to this case, this case, strictly speaking, wasn't a cryptogenic stroke in the sense mm -hmm. that his diabetes and hypertension, mm -hmm. he's got vascular risk factors. But what you do find in crystal AF is that if you put it in a monitor, particularly up to six months, you're going to get an 8.6% new diagnosis yeah. of atrial fibrillation in appropriate cases in cryptogenic stroke. And it is worth bearing in mind. And certainly we went with uh, the external monitor for a prolonged period, but some people could have re could have made the appropriate argument, particularly if someone's got frequent APCs, as we shall see, that maybe a monitor was the way to go. Biomarkers. Mm. Are biomarkers the way forward? This is a very important paper just recently published in, in, in the European Heart Journal, which looked at fibroblast growth factor and looked at pro-BNP and also picked out male sex, actually, as prognostic factors that might mm. indicate that you're more likely to develop atrial fibrillation over time. So in this setting, could you apply biomarkers with the frequent APCs, with the clinical scenario to say that's a person that we really really should be focusing on in terms of putting in a monitor for screening it may fine-tune things certainly yeah. it's
it's a, it's an area worth uh, uh, exploring further. And it goes in the direction that really atrial fibrillation, yeah, there's a systemic component to atrial fibrillation. It's not only the atrium. It's not only the atrium that is fibrillating and where we have an issue. It really is something that plays out in a systemic way. Now, what is egg and what is chicken, what is egg, that's a different story, right? I mean, because we don't really know, but um, it's definitely an interplay and there's definitely a systemic component to it. All right. No, absolutely. So I think this is all interesting. And, you know, again, I always say it to our juniors, you know, a bit like Donald Rumsfeld, you know, famously said, there are things we know we know, things we know we don't know, and things we don't know we don't know. And I always say to my colleagues, there's lots about atrial fibrillation. Oh, yeah. We're not even aware we don't know yet. Oh, yeah. But in any case, Rodin present the second case. There's a sequel to this case that four months later, the patient left on aspirin again because we had no evidence of atrial fibrillation. He presented now with a slightly more severe stroke with left hemiparesis and visuospatial inattention. And his NIHSS is eight now. And again, there's the CT to exclude hemorrhage because he is on aspirin. Mm. He has microbleeds and he had, he had previous intracerebral hemorrhage. But when we do the MRI, we see the acute infarct in the right centrum semiovale here. Uh, and this has given it that kind of almost cortical flavor of visuospatial intention because it's at that subcortical cortical mm -hmm. junction type picture. And so we now have a third infarct. Again, he's admitted to the stroke unit. His aspirin is increased in dose. He gets his assessment. We repeat the transesophageal echocardiogram to see is there any thrombus now formed left atrial appendage. Mm. Were we really right the first time? Again, the cardiac monitoring is normal, but there's frequent APCs. Mm. We control his blood pressure. But now we decide that we should put in an implantable cardiac monitor in this man. We really have enough evidence at date and discharge. And literally on day 12, we have multiple runs of AF to record. Now, the burden of these in total is less than 10 minutes. And this is another interesting mm. question about the burden of atrial fibrillation. And of course, the burden of atrial fibrillation has to be in the clinical context. And in this clinical context, we think 10 minutes was enough on day 12 for us to haul him in and reappraise as to what we were doing yeah. here. But of, course, of course, you could make an argument, right? Because ultimately, presently, with respect to the duration of atrial fibrillation and device detected a fib subclinical AFib in case he didn't really feel anything of this. We would have to consider the subclinical atrial fibrillation. We don't really know. You this don't. is why we're doing the Artesia, the NOAA trial to really find out what's the duration that really mandates anticoagulation. Currently from the ASSERT trial all we know really is that over 24 hours of AFib the risk of, AFib, uh, of stroke really increases. Anything below 6 minutes seems to have the same risk of stroke as those that don't have AFib. Yeah. But I agree. I mean with this multiple runs of AFib less than 10 minutes probably I also wouldn't have randomized that patient into RTZ. I probably also would have um, uh, would have opted for anticoagulation him having had his third yeah. uh, stroke now I think that's a you know clinical judgment I think that makes sense and so another question to the audience is that at this stage small burden would you and bearing in mind he had a previous interest cerebral hemorrhage and microbleeds, would you have considered with aspirin, continue with aspirin monotherapy therapy and just said, listen, it's a high risk game either way, whatever we do. Would we have gone with dual antiplatelets at this stage and say, well, that burden of AFib isn't enough and they're not really big, large cortical based strokes. Maybe they're not all embolic, they're border zone ones. Should we start on an oral anticoagulant with VKA? Because we assume if he does get a bleed, uh, we're more familiar how to reverse VKA. There's a defined pathway of what we're doing. Or should we go with a NOAC? Yeah. Or should we go with none of the above <laughs> and actually go with a natural appendage occlusion and avoid any risk of bleeding maybe? I can tell you that last option of yours, currently there's 7% in favor of them. But usually when we ask these types of questions, the, 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 the question of reversal frequently comes up, right? So what yeah. do you say to somebody if one of your junior doctors approaches you and says, you know, I'll start this guy on a VK because I can reverse it? Well, I always believe in rather than looking over the fence, you should be saying, I hope I don't land in a pit in the first place. So the rates of bleeding are less with no axe. So why would you start a person where we know there's a 50% reduction in intracranial bleeding? So I wouldn't go down that route. And then, of course, I would lead them into discussion of recent developments. And you and I both know uh, that even before we had a an exit alpha, you could 70% reverse a 10A inhibitor really with a four-factor piece. CC. That's and right. It, and of course, we now have, of course, Praxiband um, yeah. in terms of a daracisinab, in terms of a dibigotrin reversal as well. So I, I think that argument is fading, but of course, it's very hard 
with you know when we're used to what we did with Warfarin in changing and turning that boat slowly. Yeah, but it absolutely, is absolutely, and it, I think I couldn't agree more. And that is particularly true when we talk about intracranial hemorrhage, right? Mm-hmm. Because you know once that has happened, usually any type of reversal, there's hardly a lot of good data out there that reversal really plays an important role for intracerebral hemorrhage. So this is really something, uh, as well as for that matter, all real severe type of major bleedings. You know, try and avoid them in the first place. Try and strike a good balance between efficacy and safety in the first place. Yeah, absolutely. And so, uh, I mean, just to reiterate the point, antiplatelets yeah. are not innocent. No, <laughs> I mean, if not. you add them to a NOAC, you're doubling and tripling, but, but they're not innocent to begin with, uh, looking at that. And in terms of going back to looking in from your, our own guide, what to do with bleeding after a NOAC, you know, we very much clearly spelt out that there's minor bleeding, you know, there's minor measures that can be taken effectively mm-hmm. and even with nose bleeding you know compression and tranexamic acid before you get out the big guns but then we have specific <laughs> reversal agents as well now for the new drugs and I think this is very well illustrated uh, in the practical guide in terms of no use as well so I think uh, we are slowly winning that argument and then I suppose when it comes back if we consider this case in specific and let's say we've decided we're going to anticoagulate here Uh, Because he has had three infarcts and he has had multiple runs. And he had frequent APCs to begin with. And I'm guessing this guy has some form of atrial myopathy anyway. Mm -hmm. uh, And it's eventually going to become more and more frequent. But let's presume that that intracranial hemorrhage is relatively recent. And we're going with the oral anticoagulant. So which factors do we consider? Mm -hmm. Well, if it was a severe bleed, of course. If you had multiple cerebral microbleeds, and the pattern of those is important as well. Because if they're subcortical and it's related to hypertension then the most important thing is to control blood pressure. Uh, And of course, to outrule cerebral amyloid angiopathy if you can. Older age is a factor, of course. Uh, Of course, people who had bleeding during an um, interruption of anticoagulation is risky. Chronic alcohol abuse, etc., need for other antiplatelets. But of all those factors, really, when it boils down to it, this gentleman's ICH was remote. It wasn't recent. He did have good control of his blood pressure and we were ascribing that there was a definitive cause to his ICH in the first place. And I think that's important. And he has stood the test of time because yeah. he was being treated with high dose aspirin for a couple of months and he hasn't rebled. And antiplatelets are not innocent. And they're not innocent yeah. at all, like you just showed us. And, you know, ultimately, but what the, I think one of the most important aspects of this graph, and this is why we put it in there, is to have that discussion in the first place. Because I think it is wrong to have that monosynaptic reflex that once somebody has had a bleed, now you can make that argument best for intracranial bleeding, but also for other bleeds, you know. Once they've had a bleed, forever they will be excluded from anticoagulation. And we'll talk about no anticoagulation or about LA occluder. And I think there is a, there, there is a room for all of these. Yeah. But I think the monosynaptic reflex to just go to the, to the, to the red box here in, the, in, that, uh, in this graph is wrong. We need to take a look at this in a differentiated way. And really what you're saying is, you know, do it in a multidisciplinary uh, approach, right? Because I can't judge on the pattern. You know, I need you guys. I need the neuroradiologist for this. I can't do that, you know. Uh, we can contribute our part. The cardiologist, the, the general cardiologist can contribute their parts. Really, this is the timely way of doing this, you know. Probably, I would say, I don't know, 85% of patients with AFib, they're rather straightforward with respect to anticoagulation. Mm -hmm. But for those 15%, 20%, maybe, you know, we need to get all of our brains together and do what's best for the patient. And if those of you, I don't know if those of you out there running uh, multidisciplinary atrial fibrillation clinics, but these are the 10% we bring to our MDT. Yeah. And so the stroke uh, physician and the cardiologist and the pharmacist are involved in discussing these patients. But... There is some, you know, there is some tendency to drift towards not using anything that might cause bleeding and mm-hmm. to go down into the red box. But going back to the original, I suppose, to look at the red box, let's go down the left atrial appendage occlusion route. And this is a kind of a, a, an overview of the meta-analysis, largely from the Prevail study, actually, five-year data. But basically, amongst others, but you can see, actually, the trend is, of course, you get a reduction in hemorrhagic events because you're not using an anticoagulant, but you don't get a significant reduction in ischemic stroke by using 
using the left atrial appendage That's occluder fair. versus it actually favours the warfarin. And this is interesting, of course, and it goes back to what you're saying. It's not all about the left atrial it appendage. It isn't, yeah. That's it's exactly not. the point. It's, it's a systemic issue, right? Systemic now, issue. You know, if you really want to have the answer to a question, to a, to a question that is important for our daily clinical practice care, we need to build on those randomized clinical trials. Registries are important, like we said in the beginning. I mean, they confirm or, or don't confirm what we see in those trials. But if they confirm it, it's good. If they don't confirm it, we need to look further. But the ultimate the ultimate evidence, the ultimate causal relationship between a treatment and an effect can only be provided by randomization. That's the only way to get rid of residual confounding. That's true for all types of registries. It's true for all of those registries out there with LAA. It's also true for other types of registries. Right. No, and of course the Cluder AF is ongoing at the moment, which we're randomizing exactly. patients, of course, into a left atrial occlusion yeah. or a NOAC. So it'll be very important data. Absolutely. But the trend favors maybe, um, you know, we're not sure. We we're don't not sure. know. We don't we know. don't know. Well, what we are beginning to know, and again, of course, this is coming from registry data, but what we're beginning to appear, appear and this from retracing, if you look at people who have either lober or non lober intracranial hemorrhage, the ordinal shift here, as you can see in the modified Rankin uh, uh, scale, tells us one thing that patients who have atrial fibrillation who are not recommenced in oral anticoagulation do worse. Mm -hmm. And that appears to be a strong trend. Of course, again, this isn't randomised Absolutely. evidence. This is registry evidence. But what it does do is that it does give us the actual basis by which we can go before ethics committees and say, exactly. hand and heart, we need to do a randomised control trial here. Because you know, we're at least equipoise and certainly there's a, tr there's, a, there's a trend to say we're not going to cause harm. Mm -hmm. So that would be one way of looking at it. Of course, going back to the original meta-analysis, we do we have fifty percent reduction yeah. in intracranial hemorrhage for using NOAC. So there's no argument to be made using VKs in this setting. I would yeah. think in that regard. But I suppose the timing of which you might reintroduce them that's up in the air. What agents you might use that's up in the air, and we do need more trial evidence in that regard. And, and you know that's also a very important point because the other thing one is well, people why would people go for a VK in that situation? Reverse. Reversibility, we've knocked that down because reversibility, especially for intracranial hemorrhage and especially for VKA, where there is no antidote in the in the strict sense, um, it, it's just not it's just not an option because once the horse is bolted, you know the intracranial hemorrhage will cause an issue. The other thing is measurement. You know, you might find somebody if you find you know uh, give you the argument. Well, I'll rather put this guy on a VKA because I can measure his INR and I can see how much he's in range. Mm. Don't forget and keep in mind the vast majority of intracranial hemorrhages occurs in the therapeutic range, right? The risk goes up of intracranial hemorrhage once you hit three or four or five of an INR. But if you take all intracranial hemorrhages as the denominator, the vast majority of intracranial hemorrhages occurs with an INR of less than three. So keeping them in the therapeutic range is good from a relative point of view, but it does not give you absolute efficacy or absolute safety. You know, and picking up on that point, just to tease out the individual trials, that's what it looks like in terms of rates of bleeding. But very important, as you hit on this, I was just about yeah. to mention it, this is get with the guidelines uh, data, a very large registry which had from 140 14,000 bleeds had about 15,000 and warfarin had about 5,000 and noax and what you can see in this mm -hmm. exactly the point Jan was making if you look at the therapeutic range there and you look at the super therapeutic range and you compare it to a bleed on a noax it favours a noax. Yeah. If you then pick out the sub-analysis because many of these patients will have been on an anticoagulant and an antiplatelet for underlying ischemic heart disease that trend is accentuated. Mm -hmm. So these are bleeds, and the majority of the bleeds are occurring in the therapeutic range even, and still the mortality is worse than it is with NOAC because there would have been that trend, I can normalise the INR, mm -hmm. I can see I've normalised the INR, and therefore it should work out better, yeah. and that does not normally seem to be the case. Again, it's a registry. Yeah, but there's also data from the Aristotle trial yes. that go exactly in the same direction. Where actually, 80% of people with an intracranial hemorrhage, just the warfarin arm of the Aristotle trial, almost 80% of people had their last INR value measured at less than three. So really only a minority being in the super therapeutic the range, very much in line with these. these. And again, this is a meta-analysis done recently on the available 
um, small studies looking at many registries, really rather than randomised controlled trials, looking at interest cerebral haemorrhage in people who've had been on a NOAC versus VK. And the important point here is that because there would have been an assumption that the volume of ICH might be greater with NOAC because you could reverse warfarin. And most of these studies are older uh, than the time when we had reversal agents. And that's not true, actually. The volume appears to be the same, yeah. whether you're on warfarin or not. The last trial on the end there didn't have a comparative uh, VK arm, so mm -hmm. it's left out on its own in terms of meta-analysis and similarly in terms of mortality although the trend favours the NOAC in this particular study again there didn't seem to be huge concern uh, that VKA was going to have a lesser mortality because you could mm -hmm. reverse it and see that you reversed it with the INR and I suppose what all this is saying to us is that in terms of randomised control, control trial evidence we don't really have a big one yeah. but we have lots of clues that at least it's not as more dangerous than warfarin and we do know for a fact of course that your risk of getting an intracranial bleed is far less with the newer agents than it is Absolutely. with warfarin and that's the starting point for me key. in this yeah. whole thing but to go back to the original point I think what it's important to remember is that people who have a, no, an interest cerebral hemorrhage previously in atrial fibrillation should be going back onto their oral anticoagulant the timing of that we can discuss but what I would say oh, this is a very difficult case the first point I learned from this myself is that if it's embolic, patron, keep looking for AF. Even if there's other risk factors like hypertension and diabetes, there's a fair chance you're going to find it mm -hmm. if, you, if you pick your patient. Particularly in a person who may, you may use biomarkers in the future, we may use frequent APC count in the future. Mm -hmm. And that leads me on to the second point. Previous interest cerebral hemorrhage then is not a preclusion to oral anticoagulant treatment in AF. And the initial registry data suggests that you do better if you're oral anticoagulated again after your interest cerebral hemorrhage. And patients with AF and the previous ICH has said appear to do worse if they're not back under oral anticoagulation. Mm -hmm. But the last point, of course, is yeah. you, and this is a big point. Yeah. Everybody is an individual and there is hiatuses in our knowledge here and you need to sit down with the individual and say what are the risk yeah. factors that this person has that might make them more likely to have a recurrent bleed yeah. to modify the ones you can and then to discuss with the patient what we know, what we don't know and what the risks uh, are and I think that's very important as well to have our discussion with our patients. Absolutely, I mean, uh, patient engagement, patient empowerment is something that obviously we're, we're discussing. We're constantly discussing also at the ESC level, at the ERA level. You know, and this will this will be more and more. You know, what we're doing, we're we're moving away from this paternalistic. You know, I'm the doctor, you're the patient. I'll tell you what you need to do. We need to get the patient as well as the next kin. You know, their their families. You know, involved in the in, in, a, in a true shared uh, decision making absolutely you know before I move on to the second case, um, there's actually uh, one or two questions that we should uh, take, and, and one of them here, I find this quite interesting, and um, uh, some of the questions that you've brought in, we've probably already answered during the course of the, uh, of the, um, of the, of the presentation, but here, uh, there's one question, um, I'll, I'll summarize two or three questions. Patients with implantable devices, so a patient with a pacemaker, has had atrial fibrillation three, four, five months ago, and has since been in sinus rhythm. So his stroke risk is pretty much normal, right? No. I wouldn't say so either, right? <laughs> and the question is, where does the evidence come from? Take a look at the ASSERT trial. I think the ASSERT trial is really an important trial in that regard, right? I mean, this was in patients with implantable devices. And as a matter of fact, when you take a look at the time point when these patients or some of these patients have their strokes, only a minority of patients have had atrial fibrillation the 30 days prior to that stroke. stroke. Right. The vast majority has their strokes while they're in sinus rhythm. Mm -hmm. Again, goes in the direction that atrial fibrillation is important but there's not there's also a marker component to this with respect to stroke risk it's not all what we thought what we learned what yeah. we've taught yeah. you know over years yeah. that it's only the fibrillating atrium and this low blood flow and then the thrombus forming in the LAA it's more than this there is a systemic component to this I think there's another point in terms you may temporarily rectify uh, the atrial fibrillation of course and of course there's a discussion about dual, and, dual chamber um, pacemakers beyond my remit of expertise here as well. But <laughs> uh, to be honest, you may rectify a particular situation as caused the atrial fibrillation, but the lifetime risk of developing the atrial fibrillation may still be high then. Yeah. And the problem is, of course, that we need to periodically, regularly monitor someone. And of course, I also believe as well, going back to the duration of atrial fibrillation, 
I very often use the analogy of a cement mixer. We've got a faulty mixer and we've got cement in the mixer. And of course it's not just the mixer and the morphology of that, it's the cement going into the mixer. And of course yeah. if someone has an infection, they've got a blood that's very rich in an immunoglobulin that's more pro-thrombotic. If there's a chronic inflammatory condition, mm -hmm. if there's an underlying malignancy, these are all going to add to the fact that your cement is going to be very pro-thrombotic going into yeah. a mixer that might not be so bad mm. but it now has very bad cement in it as well and therefore is more likely to form lumps and it's a useful mm. analogy actually to give to patients uh. because patients can then understand what you're doing with the yeah, medications yeah. I, I read you that's very mm. that's very good indeed let me let me move on to the second case that's going to be a shorter case and um, I have the pleasure to be presenting uh, Dr. Honloza's data here uh, because he again he can't be here these are his disclosures and um, he has this one short case of uh, an old frail lady with age fibrillation now she's now 86 years old which also for a geriatrician like Arona would be considered old I guess um, with persistent mildly symptomatic age fibrillation uh, which was first noticed six months ago she was started on a VK at that time, but her INR values are unstable with a time and therapeutic range of less than 60. Now, personally, I would already call a TGR of less than 70 unstable. We know that the benefit really gets, you know, uh, diminishes quite dramatically once you get below that. Now, she has a history of two falls over the last three years. She has diabetes, mild hypertension, a creatinine clearance of 52, and a CHADS VASC overall, as you can see, of 5. So, uh, a high risk patient. Yet a patient that I think all of us have in front of us, you know, in front of our, you know, you know, mental eye. You know, these are the typical types of elderly frail patients with atrial fibrillation. So, question now to you is, uh, which of the following statements for that type of situation is correct? Number one, no act should not be given to frail patients. Number two, elderly patients derive less benefit from no acts compared to VKA. In elderly patients, number three, renal function must be carefully monitored when treated with NOAX. Number four, VKA and NOAX are equally effective and safe in elderly patients. And number five, aspirin is to be preferred for stroke prevention in elderly subjects with AF. And um, while we're waiting for the first results to come in, um, maybe, uh, Ronan, what about aspirin in the elderly? So you've convinced us that aspirin is not a benign drug overall, but in the elderly, it's, it's better, right? No. No. <laughs> and it's, it's even less of an instant drug in older people as well. And, of course, going back to the concept, actually, what strikes me when I see this case is the term frail. Yeah. We've tried to introduce this language in the practical guides itself because, of course, yeah. frailty is an important concept. It's a huge medical issue and how you define frailty. And I think we've given people a, a feeling for the Rockwood, um, um, mm -hmm. the Canadian model mm -hmm. of how you might see the phenotype of frailty in front mm -hmm. of you. But I suppose as an easy one, what I often use in clinic if you want to see if someone's frail is to do a, a, what we call a timed get up and go test where yeah. someone's sitting in the chair in front of you, ask them to get up out of the chair, to walk over to three metres to the door, come back and sit down. You should be able to complete that in about between 10 and 20 seconds and, and do it relatively independently. If they struggle to do that, and they're quite slow doing that you've got a fair idea that they're probable frailty yeah that's very useful and i think that this concept is extremely important because it gives us much more of an idea than the chronological age in and of itself because that has a huge variation right whereas frailty really tells us this patient is at high risk however that patient is not only at high risk of bleeding because this is frequently what we focus on that patient is also at high risk for ischemic stroke and th this is sometimes what we what we tend to ignore we have that blind spot for the ischemic stroke we feel we have that patient in front of us and we feel when we now start an anticoagulate that patient and the patient has a bleeding event it's our fault it's iatrogenic whereas if we actively decide to not anticoagulate that patient the patient then has a stroke you know indirectly that's also at least partly our fault because we actively said we're not going to anticoagulate that patient um, yet we don't feel this way we feel more that this is then the natural course of the disease so you know it's not our fault the stroke but it's our fault the bleeding and this misconception really drives us into underuse and it's important to realize this because you know when we take a look at the trial evidence again the hardest type of evidence that we have we can see See that in fact there's no interaction by age when you take NOACs compared to vitamin K antagonists. They benefit the same in terms of relative efficacy and also in terms of relative safety. Importantly, however, and this goes along with what you were saying, these patients come from a higher absolute risk. So if you have the same relative risk reduction with a higher absolute risk, your absolute risk reduction will be bigger.
And since the absolute risk reduction is driving the number needed to treat, you actually need to treat fewer patients, fewer elderly patients with a NOAC versus VKA to prevent an event than younger patients. So you get a better bang for the buck. Mm. You know, if you do this with the elderly, uh, these are the safety data also here. Um, uh, you know, this is across all NOACs. Um, uh, there's, there's no interaction, uh, but there are some differences between the NOACs uh, with respect to the safety profile, but overall, this is really convincing. So uh, this is how we ultimately then put it into our guide. This is a summary slide of this, right? So neither the over 75 year older patients, the frail patients, patients at increased risk of falling, dementia, none of those in and of itself should be reason not to anticoagulate, to withhold anticoagulation because these patients really derive the biggest benefit. We need to keep stroke in mind. A stroke in these patients takes them completely out. They usually don't return to their normal lives. They can't enjoy their families and their grandchildren anymore. We frequently focus too much on the bleeding side. We also need to focus on stroke in these, uh, in these patients. And like we said, before, you know, stroke and atrial fibrillation is much more than we had previously thought. This is one of the things that we thought we knew that in fact we didn't know and we're only now really learning, you know, what is causing stroke and atrial fibrillation and there's a good chance that, you know, if we meet again in 10 years, we'll again be much further in terms of our knowledge. Um, we've already seen this, uh, in fact, uh, this is really one of the part of the puzzle and an important part of the puzzle because the PROTECT, the PREVAIL trial, those were very important trials, uh, randomized trials, comparing LAA to a watchman device to, to warfarin. And even if you take out the procedural ischemic strokes down here, you still have no reduction in you numeric a numerical increase in, in, in stroke. And we need to have trial evidence to really prove this. Um, uh, and, and fortunately, those are now ongoing. Until then, it is, I think, wise to stick with what we have in terms of trial evidence um, uh, in terms of guidelines. I'm sorry, these are the ESC guidelines that they say LA occluders should really be for contraindicated patients. Um, this is from 2016 and now just two weeks ago the new American guidelines came out and they reiterated this also um, but pretty much with exactly the same wording uh, that this should be re, uh, you know, reserved for these types of patients. I think these are uh, these are important concepts. Now, um, with these two uh, um, uh, cases, um, you know, I think some uh, instructive cases, types of cases, patient cases that we see, um, well, yeah, you know, on, we, on a daily we, basis, right? Yeah, and I think we went for two kind of extremes. You went for very yeah. much a kind of a critical bleeding um, kind of case where you'd really pause to think before you would anticoagulate someone again and what you might anticoagulate with yeah. them. And we delved into, of course, how long we should monitor monitor for, and uh, maybe dipped our toe in the water of what other signals we might get of who you might monitor longer for. But the second case is very much a phenotype that all of us see. And I think you absolutely made the point that with older people, and you spoke about that 86-year-old maybe even being older from my clinic. Well, I think I was telling you beforehand, I went fishing last with a guy who was 94 years of age and he organised a trip and it yeah, wasn't. A, so I think the phenotype in front of you, you know, is important. So the age needs to be put to one side. And even within that, like you said, a person who is frail or who's had one or two falls or someone who has had dementia, those groups aren't homo homogenous either. That's correct. There's, you know, I mean, of course, we're not advocating that you should anticoagulate people who've got severe frailty, who've got reduced life expectancy, who've got very limited mobility, or people who've got severe cognitive exactly. decline, who've got very limited mobility. But you also make the point that people in the earlier stages of those diseases or conditions have very much reduced reserve. So even a small ischemic event will probably make it impossible for many of those people to come back uh, to their previous level of function and may ultimately result in residential care. Exactly. And we, we really tend to have that blind spot for this. I mean, this is our responsibility. I mean, we won't, we don't want to anticoagulate at all costs. Yes. We need to strike a good balance mm -hmm. between efficacy and safety, but we need to keep efficacy in the equation. It's an important part of the equation. We need to prevent stroke in these patients. Now, one high risk situation, and this is now turning over to the questions, to your questions. Thank you very much for submitting those, all of those. And, and please keep doing so while we're, uh, while we're approaching the uh, the final uh, 10 to 12 minutes here um, one of the one of the aspects of the high risk patients that we haven't touched on really uh, in, during during our presentations is renal disease mm -hmm. right renal insufficiency so um, so what about what about moderate renal insufficiency say clearance of 30 to 50 milliliters per minute would you prefer to go with a VKA or with a NOAC would you anticoagulate these patients at all 
Well, it's, well, it's very interesting you say that. Uh, first of all, I think we have anticoagulated people uh, with VKAs with renal disease more out of tradition than out of evidence. The first thing is actually, even if you looked at, there was a very nice paper looking at renal decline in people on warfarin and people who run a NOAC. Mm -hmm. The most renally excreted NOAC, because mm -hmm. it happens, the bigotron. Mm -hmm. And the rate of renal decline was far greater in people on warfarin over 30 months. And of yeah. course, there is this concern that warfarin affects the gamma carboxylization um, of one of the enzymes associated with vascular calcification. You may get accentuated vascular calcification. So, we, and if you actually look at the evidence for warfarin in end stage renal disease, mm -hmm stroke prevention who have atrial fibrillation it isn't good actually well there's no randomized there's no evidence <laughs> whatsoever right but there's one that's serious where it caused more harm exactly exactly so again a situation where we think we're doing something good but yeah. we're not so I think in moderate renal insufficiency you know um, it is absolutely okay to use NOx absolutely. in fact there's there's evidence now from the Aristotle trial where in fact the benefit in terms of safety might even be bigger for the NOAC, Pixaban in that case, as compared to VKA, as renal function goes down, which yeah. is actually quite uh, quite interesting. And then once you reach uh, severe renal insufficiency, so below 30 milliliters per minute, we really don't have any data. I mean, in our guide, we put a yellow arrow yeah. for the 10A inhibitors because we feel that, you know, in view of the fact that there's really no data, but also no data for VKA, you know, it might be okay to keep them on it until you're 25, at 20, yeah. you know, and then once you're, once you're approaching end-stage renal failure, mm. I mean, we're really at a loss of data. We just simply have no clue. No, the very small numbers that ended up in that category yeah. within the individual trials. Yeah. And I, so that's the first point. And I think the second point is, of course, is that when people are in moderate renal disease, the basic message is we need to watch them more closely. Oh, yeah. And obviously Absolutely. dose reduction as per the SPCs, but as a cohort of people, there is some evidence emerging, particularly probably with the Pixaban and people at the more in stage renal disease and begin to emerge a little bit of a doxpas. But yeah. you're right, at this stage, it's a little bit of a grey area. But yeah. I think we came up with the rule, wasn't it? Creatinine clearance divided yeah. by 10 for the yeah. interval of months as to how often you would follow them up. Yeah. But minimum, going, huh? minimum, minimum, yeah. yeah. But going back to that patient that, you, uh, that uh, Stefan gave us as an example, mm. I think if that patient was in our clinic, we would probably follow her up monthly at least yeah. for three months to yeah. ensure that there was stability in renal function. Yeah, and also that, you know, she's doing well with whatever NOAC you treated her with, yeah, right? Yeah. I mean, she might have had one of those nuisance bleedings. And, you know, these are the types of bleedings that people usually don't tell us about. Yeah. Right? I mean, but they will stop their anticoagulant for it. And then, you know, then, then we have the problem and they return uh, to your service with a stroke. And this is why it makes sense to monitor those patients closely. Even if we don't monitor the INR, we monitor her clinically and monitor her renal function. Another issue that also in those high-risk patients, elderly patients, that is frequently a problem is, you know, when, when resorption is limited. Like, for example, patient with diarrhea. How do you deal with that? Mm -hmm. And we've come across as well patients, not common now, but patients with partial gastrectomies. Yeah. Now, there's kind of case reports at best. Yeah. And I suppose the patients who've got short bowel syndrome, partial gastrectomies, or maybe chronic irritable bowel or frequent diarrhea, mm -hmm. I think this is one of the arguments going back to our guide where we begin to float the idea, Jan, that maybe we could look at drug levels in some meaningful way yeah. for this cohort of yeah. patients. Yeah. Now, you could say the same thing to an extent with people who are very, very high BMIs. Mm. Are you better off using a VK in those circumstances because you know what the INR is? Mm. And that's a debatable point. Yeah. I'm sure you could get 10 people in here and five of us would be on opposite sides. Exactly. But, but I think going forward, we don't have the evidence. Mm. And going forward, I think there's an argument for saying, well, if you can measure drug levels and show you're in range, then you know, maybe... Yeah, that yeah, is the way forward. Yeah, yeah, that's right. I mean, take take that patient with with diarrhea, for example. I mean, you know, that patient might have a reduced absorption of the drug, but that patient might actually also run into renal issues at the same time. Especially the elderly, once they get dehydrated, these are the most important types of situations where they really run into troubles. This is why I, I always sensitize my patients to this. Number one, they have to be there, you know, and twice every, every other month or whatever, yeah. but also to sensitize them to situations where they might be dropping their renal function in between, like diarrhea, like an infection, like when it's really hot outside, any type of these, you know, tell them, you know, if that happens, please come and see me or your primary care physician so that we can check how things are. Mm. 
think drug level monitoring is something that we will be looking at and that we will be mm. seeing more in the future as well. Yeah. You know, none of the companies wants to hear it because obviously <laughs> this is not the way that the, the drugs were developed. And of course, we have to admit, huh? so in way over 95, 98% of patients, we don't need to do it. Right? We don't need to do it. These drugs were developed and were tested without any type of measurement, and they worked very well. But there are situations where it may make sense. We need to keep in mind we don't have, like you said, any trial evidence. We also don't know any target ranges. The ones that we put in our guide, and we really stuck at our head uh, yeah, there, yeah. you know, yeah. are, are, the, are, the, are the peak and trough levels that are observed in the trials. You know, these are not target ranges. But in that patient, for example, with diarrhea, yeah. it would show you where normally a patient would end up with their trough level, for example. And so it gives you a little bit of an idea. You would not recommend to dose a certain NOAC based on a certain trough or a peak level. We're far away from that, especially with respect to yes. trial evidence. Yeah. Okay. So here's another one. And I think that's also an important one or an interesting one, you know, talking about high risk patients. What about patients uh, undergoing PCI? I would have asked Stefan Hondos of this, but unfortunately he couldn't make it. So, uh, Ronan. So you have to ask the non cardiologist <laughs> who's undergoing PCI. Well, I think there's a couple of talents that even I know as a non cardiologist <laughs> in this regard that clearly, if you have a primary um, intervention in terms of coronary arteries, you'll need an anti platelet if a stent is being put in. So, we yeah. all accept that. Yeah. We also accept the fact that you'll need a dual anti platelet. But we accept as well, we know from the evidence that the longer you continue dual anti platelets, the more bleeding you'll get. And of course, the balance here is that. What's the minimum amount of time I need to take my dual antiplatelet in addition to my anticoagulant for my atrial fibrillation before I can come off it? And mm -hmm. I think an uncomplicated PCI is, and of yeah. course I'm, I don't do PCI, so I can't tell you what's a complicated one or uncomplicated one, but from talking to colleagues I know that difficult channeling through left mainstem yeah. occlusions are complicated ones. You're probably looking at a minimum of three months dual antiplatelets and then down to monotherapy. Yeah. And, and basically within our guide we very much moved that way and I think the VOST trial amongst others has shown very much that we have probably continued dual antiplatelets a bit too long for too many patients yeah. and caused excess bleeding. Yeah. I think that's probably a general overview. Yeah, I think that is exactly it. I mean, the point that we really make in our guide also, and this is also true for the guidelines, I mean, you have to individualize this enormously. Like you have to individualize NOAC therapy in general, especially in the setting of PCI, of, of triple therapy. You know, this is absolutely key. There is no one-size-fits-all solution you know and uh, but really like you're saying I think the duration of triple therapy is decreasing further and further and further and there are some data out there now the pioneer uh, pilot trial if you want to uh, with rivaroxaban and also redual PCI with the bigger trend that have really shown us that we can reduce bleeding quite massively and probably probably the effect on ischemic events is not all that huge there are two more trials out there the entrust trial with edoxaban that will be presented at ESC probably this year uh, and uh, then the Augustus trial, which will be presented in one, one and a half months yeah. at the ACC. Uh, so this will really then shape this even further. But this is really a, as it is. We're moving, you know, shorter and shorter in terms of triple anticoagulation. My, my one comment about the Pioneer trial in particular, and, and this is, we need to be alert about this, obviously, in terms of the dose that yeah. has been used in that yeah. trial. And of course, once that period ends, it's important to remember that that dose was not trialed for exactly. stroke prevention beyond the initial mm. period. And uh, I have one concern that there may be confusion around the dose. Um, and I think we need to be vigilant around that. Okay. Absolutely. And this goes along into the last question that uh, we can tackle for uh, tonight. That's uh, among NOACs, is once daily dosing only advisable for edoxaban and rivaroxaban? Once daily dosing. Yes. But Is that it? only advisable for edoxaban and rivaroxaban, but also, or also maybe for others, for the others? Well, no. Well, I mean, the doxaban and rivaroxaban SPCs, it is a one steady uh, dose. Uh, so, I mean, exactly. but again, of course, this is where some of the confusion, if you go back to the Pioneer, goes that we were using a BD 2.5. And this is something that we probably need to be careful about. Exactly. This we is need to specify. Absolutely. This is, this is why we also put also this in, our, in, a, in yeah. a big table, you know, not to confuse drugs indications and, and, and patient profiles yes. like for example you're mentioning rivaroxaban this likely will be approved within this year for patients with atherosclerosis without atrial fibrillation 
based mm. on the compass trial. Yeah. Completely different population, completely different dosing. So really keep in mind the right drug, the right dose for the right indication. That's absolutely crucial because otherwise it'll be a huge mess yeah. and we're completely in the woods with respect to any uh, trial evidence. No, and I think we need to stick to the SPCs when it comes yeah. to stroke prevention and yeah. atrial fibrillation. And obviously, acute PCI is a separate uh, indication, separate. but you need to be vigilant once that period is over that you reappraise what we're doing. Yeah. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Well, I guess um, we're sort of approaching the end of this webinar and I I'd like to uh, close the session just by briefly summarizing uh, the key messages for your uh, mm -hmm. daily clinical practice. I think number one, in 2019, now 10 years after the NOACs hit the field, uh, they are standard therapy for stroke prevention based on all the trial data that we have, based on all the registry data that we have. High-risk patients, like many of the scenarios that we discussed tonight, um, uh, high-risk patients derive the greatest benefit for stroke prevention, but they're also at the greatest risk for bleeding. Uh, while they're at a great risk, for, a large risk for bleeding, we need to keep in mind that the primary goal of anticoagulation is stroke prevention, because preventing strokes in these patients will have a severe impact, positive impact, on patients' quality of life as well as on mortality. Of course, by whatever what we're doing, we need to strike a good balance between efficacy and safety. It is absolutely crucial to individuals therapy. We now have four NOACs available. Um, there is no one-size-fits-all NOAC. There is no one-size-fits-all anticoagulant regimen. Uh, we need to individualize therapy based on the SMPCs, based on the randomized trial data evidence. It makes things uh, more complicated. Yeah. You know, 10 years ago we had warfarin and that was pretty much it. Maybe aspirin. Mm -hmm. But aspirin is out now and warfarin is pretty much on its way out for the vast majority of patients. You know, so it is getting more complicated. Complicated. We have four NOACs, but like we said in the beginning, and I think this is where those data from the Sweden, but also data from the UK that go in a very similar direction uh, are aiming at or are telling us, you know, it's worth investing time into. You know, we are all spending this hour today here, the two of us, you uh, at home, when we could be spending time with our family, enter into the weekend, you know, <laughs> we're investing time into, into this because we want to treat our patients best. And it's great to see that there are some data that are really showing us that what we're doing will have an impact on our patients. I'd like to thank you, uh, Ronan, a lot you. Uh, for your uh, presentation and for the lively interaction. Thank you. Uh, also, thanks to Professor Honloza, <laughs> who unfortunately couldn't make it, but for his presentation anyways. Uh, the program uh, was supported by Bering Engelheim in the form of an educational grant. And please remember, you'll be able to watch this webinar on demand on the ESC website. Um, and I thank you very much for joining tonight, and I wish you all a very good evening. Thank you. Thank you.